you know, we, yeah. we're still indie. Uh, we decided we got all the deals back and we were like, none of this really fits the vision. It and just didn't fit us. And it like, also felt website. like they were really invested in Dark Side because it was a song mm. that did great. And it didn't feel like they right. were as invested in what we saw for yeah. the money. We knew that we wanted to do something and we didn't want someone else to kind of hinder our vision. So we decided at that time, all just right, to let's keep doing stick it to our, our guns. We'll, we'll stay indie. The album had tripled in streams overall. So the whole record was seeing this massive benefit because from it was so cool Dark Side. Dark Side had been out a year before it went viral. Yeah, um, it was not right. a so viral hit off right the bat. Like it no. just it wasn't. Like it was just the song yeah. that I loved and put out and the fans loved, and then had this moment that was lightning in a bottle. Very, very, very hard to replicate. We have tried. <laughs> What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book, hardcover, ebook, audiobook, third edition is out now everywhere. Today, my guest is Niani. Cross my heart and hope to die. Welcome to my dark side. And the song that you've been hearing is Niani's song, Dark Side, which has hundreds of millions of views on TikTok and hundreds of millions of streams on the various streaming platforms. They are sisters, Caitlin and Sid, and they talk about how completely independently they released their music through DistroKid, how they've gotten over 2 billion views, hundreds and hundreds of millions of streams, independently. We go into all of it that yes, they've had some TikTok success, but they've had success on all the platforms on YouTube and Instagram and Spotify and Apple and, and everything. And they've really spread it out and they've kind of talked about their workflow and how they went from performing in empty bars acoustically as teenagers to where they are now with uh, where they will talk about later getting flown out to LA and meeting with all these various major labels and turning them down and why they turned them down and how those meetings went and just kind of the the whole process of building a career independently and they're they're definitely in the building stages um you know even though they have over 7 million monthly listeners just on Spotify alone they haven't toured yet in the last few years uh, since those early days of course of playing bar gigs and so you know they're figuring that out and so we really talk it through uh they're very smart they are true DIYers uh they will talk about how could they kind of learned to do everything themselves from recording to video editing, um, posting, scheduling process, all of that. It was a, a very exciting conversation. They talk very fast. <laughs> For most podcasts, I know you might speed it up to like a 1.2, 1.5. This is one you might want to slow down to a 0.8 or something like that because we, we go very quickly in this. Um, but it was it was very exciting and inspiring talking to both of them. And they they really have a strong handle on their business and, and what they're building and how they're creating and releasing it. You can find Niani, N-E-O-N-I, everywhere uh, that you can find a band. Just search for them on TikTok and Instagram, Spotify, Apple, wherever you want to find them, you can find them. YouTube, of course. You can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, X, Threads, all that stuff. You can find me at Ari Herstan on Instagram. But right now, if uh, you visit Ari'sTake.com, sign up for our email list. That is where you're going to get the most up-to-date information about the new music business. We send out new messages about the uh, new episodes and stuff you need to know about the new music business. Get on the email list, ariestake.com. But right now, if you could just pause this, leave us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on YouTube, subscribe, hit the thumbs up, leave a comment. I love reading the comments. Um, yeah, and follow, subscribe everywhere you listen to this. All right, let's kick it into the show. Niani, welcome Hi. to the show. We're so excited <laughs> hey, to be here. Hey. Oh my God, be like, yes. oh man. Always in oh, sync. Sisters, that's what you do, right? Sisters, you just lock man. right in. Sisters. Every single time. Um, 
<laughs> That's great. So um, it seems like you're in a um, an active release rollout period right now. Did I get that right? Did I see you're doing the waterfall release method? Are we on a release? Congratulations on releasing Utopia first of Thanks. all. Thanks. Thank you. It's awesome. Yeah, we're definitely cooking up something. We haven't announced anything mm -hmm. yet. Um, right. But, you but know, I mean, as soon as you start I waterfalling. Think there's there's some there's some ideas. <laughs> I always gives a little bit of it away. I mean, we do uh, Discord right. uh, live streams every release, and they have been nice. begging us to confirm something. But and um, they they already know. They I think that there's definitely a thought. So we're just gonna leave it there. Mm -hmm. There's a thought. There's a cool. There are, things are obviously waterfalling. So. Yes, yes, things are waterfalling. Um, yeah, so so far you've released four songs that I see off of this new whatever it may be, exciting new project. It sounds great. Uh, you already have uh, some some spikes, some love. Uh, Body Bag is getting some extra love right now, I've been seeing, which is so cool. You worked with my friend Dr. Clips, Evan Blum, who yes! we also had on the show. I literally yeah. watched your interview with him last night. Because <laughs> I was like, no way, oh, nice. just worked with oh, Evan. We love Evan. Um, he is yeah. the most high end energy. He's always got like insane ideas. Also, he does really dangerous stuff when he shoots. Not he us. Doesn't. He never makes <laughs> us do anything. But he's like hanging off buildings. Yeah, he's like, here, hold on one second. Let me just, I'll just hang off the side of this building so we can get this clip. I'm like, dude, you're gonna, you're gonna die. die. And I, we're good friends. He's like, no, <laughs> I've got this, this rock climbing stuff. Um, I'm like, yeah. he swears by mm -hmm. it. No, he's gonna die. He That's is awesome. the well, coolest dude. Yeah, I mean, he gets the shot, you know, and uh, I saw you do, uh, I mean, you did a little bit of the running through, you know, a, a parkour-ish or in, in the streets of, uh, was it LA? You must have come to LA to shoot with yeah, him, right? Yeah, it was LA. Yeah. Okay, it looked like I, I spotted, I, I think I was trying to spot the locations of where you were. It's interesting, because when he came on the show, he said, he's like, I'm done with, with music videos, I only shoot vertical, but then for you... He did, a, I, I mean, I guess you'd call it a music video. It was, yep. a, it was a one take, but it was horizontal. Yep. Uh, it was for, what was it, Utopia? It was for I forget Utopia. Now. Yeah, it was for Utopia. He always talks about how much he he's not going to do it. He's like, I don't want to do it. Like, I'm not doing it. And then I saw a video <laughs> came out with uh, a great Price. artist called Connor Price. And he uh -huh. had a long form. It was Evan. And I, and I was like, Evan immediately. And I was like, can I? That and looks he was really like, good. Yeah, his wife or his fiance Julie, who is the best. Yeah, um, she was like, "I'll I'll make sure he does it." So I was like, "Thanks, <laughs> Julie. Nice. We got we got it unlocked." But yeah, he's just the. And yeah. when we say there was literally that was one pass, we didn't even there was we didn't do it twice. No, we didn't do it we, twice. It was two minutes. We oh wow! Because as he said, because I've been editing most of our music videos this year, um, and oh, like cool. one last year, so. I know how hard it is to get a music video. Yeah. It takes me like probably like what four or five days to yeah. edit generally, especially when I was editing on my old computer that uh constantly crashed. Thank God you finally listened to me and bought the new one. Yeah. So <laughs> watching Evan like get it in one take and like being yeah. able to get on the plane and go home and not have four like, days of editing, it's done. It was a breath of fresh air, I'm not gonna lie. Although I love editing That's awesome. music videos. It was it was Yeah, nice. yeah. Well, let's talk about some of your videos because um, you know, what I was most impressed aside from the music, of course, but is just the volume of content that you put out, uh, specifically videos, short form videos, I mean, and songs. I mean, I think, before we get into the videos, I, if correct me if I'm wrong, I believe I counted 87 songs that you have released, yeah. is that right? Yeah. yeah. That is wild. I think it's crazy. Like, we haven't counted, so people just tell I me. I counted. Yes, <laughs> shout out to you. People just like, will be like, you have this many songs out, and I'm like, Sounds about and right. We've taken two albums down, just yeah. like from when you were kids. Wow. So we've been a band. Yeah. I think what pe a lot of people don't know is we've been in a band together for a decade plus. We started our first band when I was 11. Yep. And I was so. Wow. Because at first we were soul artists. We learned how to play music and started writing music. We're sisters, and I was so like, we fought yeah. all the time. Like, and we're like, we can't do right. that. <laughs> I don't want to be in a band with you. No. And then we started our first band when I was 11. So we've been doing this our entire lives. So yeah. our, our, yeah. our story is kind of weird and meanders a lot but yeah it ended up being like a ton of music still to this mm -hmm. day right and i saw i mean the, at least the first single that you still have up is from 2017 mm -hmm. but really the flow of music i think it started to kind of pour out in 2020 or so yeah. um talk about just kind of the journey of uh, making music, releasing music, the sound evolution, um, and then we'll get into videos and, and how that has evolved and progressed. But first, let's 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 just talk about the music. Yeah, totally. So yeah, like I said, we started our first band when I was a child. And yes, yeah. we were, our entire background was live music. So we did like 
hundreds and hundreds of live shows at empty coffee shops and bars around. As Niani or as just this like Caitlin like, and Sid or something? It was a different band name. This is actually our third oh. band name. This one's We've gone through. Okay. This, one, <laughs> this, this one is our best We're band. Done. Um, but <laughs> just as kids, we had like some, some like as kind of everyone does, but it's, it was always just the two of us. Yeah. And so sure. after that, we moved into like YouTube covers, like you said, with videos and stuff, because that was right. what we saw kind of working. And at the time, it was like 2015, 2016. Also, at that point, we had been, we did like 50 shows over a summer uh, in wow. uh, in and around Denver, because yeah. that's where we were based at the time. And gotcha. we made like no money. Um, and mm-hmm. I think at that point, our parents were helping us tour. Uh, yeah. Shout out to them. Um, and we were, like, were like barely breaking even. Yeah, so barely. It was like, yeah. And they were like, we're really barely. tired of you playing in dive bars. Yeah. I was like, yeah. listen, I get it. <laughs> I, I'm tracking. And they were like, yeah. okay, so how do we make this sustainable? Especially my dad. Because my dad's a very practical yeah. business. Our, our dad is like, He's, yeah. he's the MVP of when it comes to like Niani business and how we And he was like, if you want to be nice. an artist for the rest of your life, you have to make money. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Fair. That's like a very real fact that I think every <laughs> artist hates is like, all right, now I have to figure out, you know, how to live off of my art. So after right. we kind of ended our live, like touring all the time days, we moved into YouTube covers. We always like were music songwriters. Um, we loved that, but we were practical at that time where it was like, all right, we have to mm. start building an audience so we can eventually okay. get back to live was kind of our, our own sure. thought. So we did huh. that for like two years. We released a video every like every other week. Mm-hmm. I think for two we years, had just built mm. a home studio um, and home studio is loose. The gear was not good. Our gear is terrible, <laughs> but we had to record the songs. And so we were sure. recording our own YouTube covers. And at that time, we were learning so Everything much it was, about yeah. music recording and like yeah. engineering and all of that type of stuff. And probably video editing as well. Yeah, well, at that time, that. my yeah. dad was helping us edit our videos. And it was, oh, nice. you know, okay. he's Great. just the bomb all when it fan. comes to that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, he, it makes him have respect for what I do now when I edit our music videos. Yes. Because um, he yeah. did it before mm-hmm. I did. Um, he's not a video editor, cool. by the way. I always feel like I need to clarify that. He's not in art at all. He has a normal oh. nine to five job. Not in okay. art. Um, but he's helpful. Great. So we did Sweet. that for two years, learned a ton. And then we, we met a producer in Nashville yeah. um, named David Spencer right at the end of doing mm. that. And um, I think I was 15, 15 years old this time. And uh, we started writing with him over Skype and just like immediately connected and uh, started traveling out here to write. Okay. And I remember when Skype was a thing and it wasn't just Zoom. And it wasn't yeah. just Zoom. <laughs> like, we were Skype days, man. We, right, right. We just wrote a few songs together and usually like anyone who's done like a Skype session or even a Zoom session knows they're generally speaking trash. Like they're, they're specifically not, not fun. fun yeah. or terrible sessions. Like it's yeah. audio is cutting in and out. They just don't work. The vibe isn't there. But with him. Wait, so what brought you to Nashville when you were still teenagers? I mean, was this also your dad be like, oh, Nashville's the spot. Let's go out there and, and find somebody who knows how to make music and write a song or something? Yeah. So we were still in Denver when we met David, who's in Nashville. And one thing yeah. about our family is we've moved around our entire lives. We've lived yeah. in three time zones. Uh, my dad grew okay. up in the same house like his entire life. And so when him and my mom got married, uh, they were like, let's get out and go see, see the world everywhere. So yeah. we've seen everywhere. We've lived in like four states. Uh, so moving cool. to Nashville after we started working with David, they've always kind of wanted to live in Tennessee. My mom's actually originally from Tennessee. Mm-hmm. So mm. they were just like, cool, let's let's move to Tennessee. And, and I was like, we, we okay. were traveling out here like once a month to write. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I love Southwest Airlines, but I'm not I'm that much being on plane. <laughs> I don't want to do that. And I love, I mean, I still yeah. to this day, I love Denver. Like it's mm-hmm. one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite places on the whole earth, Colorado. But yeah. it was yeah. just, it kind of felt like time to, to find a new place. And so when we were, when I was 16, we moved out to Nashville Mm -hmm. and we started getting really involved in licensing, the licensing team. So music for film and television. Like sync licensing. Yep. Yep. We did that Mm -hmm. for two or three years, probably two years. And we just did, I mean, it was like every week we'd have a few like sessions. Three or four, like like, let's write for a UFC fight. Let's write for a shoe ad or a TV show. Writing the briefs. We did a lot of that. People would pull up trailers and you have to, you know, write Write the trailer. Like to the trailer vibe. Very, very interesting to do as a young person because it was- Were you working with a sync agent at the time or was this through David or through other producers that they had sync agents and they would bring the briefs to the session and be like, oh, we just got this brief from UFC or whatever. Yeah, so at the time we were working with one boutique and then uh, now and kind of very quickly after we started work- working with one, we do schedule A. So we work with like a bunch. If someone's got a session, they send it over yeah. to us and, you know, 
it's just it's cool. kind of more. And, and to clarify, schedule A just means that uh, y- you are not exclusive to any one agency. Yeah. That you can uh, give certain songs. You put them in what's called a schedule A, which is like an addendum to the contract, which says like this agency will get these songs, this agency get this songs, and so you can be working with a bunch of different agencies, and they all have different uh, pieces of your catalog. Yeah, and what. I find helpful about doing it that way is certain agencies are better are at better at things. certain things. So there's like some mm-hmm. agencies that are really good at promos and some that are really good with ads. And so yeah. if you give like an ad song to a promo person, that song may never just do anything. Kind of sits on the hard drive. No, nah, because it's not a great song of potential, but because it's with the wrong. Sure. Song. So that's what that's- we did for years. And then that- right at to the end of 2019, that's where our focus was. Yeah. Because we were making consistent money. We changed our band name to Niani at the time. It was, I think, 2018 mm-hmm. or 2019. I don't... Okay. One of those. I know it's recent and I should know that because it's like a big life. But moment. it's been a whirlwind. But it's been a yeah. whirlwind. So sure. I think it was 2018, 2019. We changed our band name. We started releasing some of the licensing songs under mm-hmm. Niani. And yeah. that was... Okay. That was kind of... We were in Nashville. We were coming into it like adulthood trying to figure out how to like live a life. Music. But then 2020 hit, which was a very interesting time for all licensing artists because shows stopped filming. So you had nothing. There was no spots to license anymore. And as probably every Mm -hmm. licensing artist out there knows, like licensing is a weird way to make a living anyway. It can be great, but you can get one spot and not get paid out for a year. So Mm -hmm. not getting any spots because there was no filming for six months. Just means like, oh, the payouts start getting away now. Really concerned. Yeah. So we had Mm -hmm. to really figure out like, okay, what do we do next? Live music that we have always done? Not there. Licensing no music life. that we've always done right. is not there. And so, like, so what what does Niani look next? like without any of its its core, without any of its history? Basically. What do we what do we yeah. do next, basically? And I would love to say that we planned it, but it we kind of just happened. So end of 2019, actually, a guy who ran a YouTube channel called Night Blue Music, his name's Jake. He's an amazing dude. He reached out, I think on Facebook. Yeah. No, 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 he emailed us. It was an email? Yep. And then we friend each other on Facebook. Yes. And he was like, hey, I have this buddy named Bessomorph, and he's a DJ. And I love, I think it was like one of our songs, like Fallout or Omens or something. And he was like, I love this song. I want you guys to do a song together. Can I connect you? And I'll release it on my YouTube channel. And I'll release it like on my YouTube channel, and we'll go about it that way. And I was like, cool. Cool. Yeah, let's do it. Um, that sounds good. We have a home studio, so like, what else are we doing? Because Bessemorph was at that time based in Germany. Yeah, he's he was in Germany at the time. Mm. So we just got a track from Bessa, wrote over the track, and that song ended up becoming Army, which uh, ah. randomly really did really well. well. So what ended up happening mm-hmm. is that song kind of got wrapped up. That song got put on a label, like an indie label called NCS, which is a big dance label, especially in Europe. And word kind of got around that we were new top liners in the space. And then like eight other DJs hit us yes, up to do, tracks, to do songs. And so we were like, okay, like wow. this, this is a cool. thing. And then when ARMY ended up coming out, tons of different DJs were hitting us up. And it was all on Facebook Messenger, which I think is really- I find it very interesting because huh. we're, <laughs> we're American. I don't really use Facebook right. Messenger, but it's very big right. still in like Europe. And I was like, okay, it's like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. So- huh. Yeah, it was very interesting. So then we started doing every other week we would release. We would release one DJ collab a and month. one Niani song. Because we always wanted to establish the Niani brand and we had a bunch of music. Yeah. So that mm-hmm. led to us doing every other week for two years. Which was a lot of wow. songs. An insane yeah. pace. Looking back at it now. 87 songs. Yeah, exactly. And that's <laughs> right, how right. that catalog got Looking built. Looking back at it yeah, now, yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. I wonder how we did it. I'm yeah, like, I don't, I don't, when did yeah. I sleep? Because we were writing like yeah. we were writing like two to three days a week. But then we were also like, you know, you got to edit your vocals. And you have to like do notes. Like DJs will send the song right. back to you. You got to do notes. And then we were still making Miani music too. Mm-hmm. So it was right. just this insane. That point, all of our top lines were recorded in the home studio. Yep. So we were basically on a like a crash course to figure out like, how do I record a vocal we that knew I can send to somebody? Because of the yeah. background in our covers and mm-hmm. that kind of We day, had an idea. We knew sure. what we were yeah, doing there, yeah. to an extent. Um, but I learned yeah. so, so much. much. We actually had a friend By- record some of ours at first. And then I was like, all right, 
I should probably just learn how to do this no. on our own. It was COVID, so I was no, like, gotta great. learn how to do it. Be self sufficient. Yeah. yeah. Did did the, working with these DJs did that influence the direction of your sound, the Niani sound for your original music? I would definitely say it had. Influence. Yeah, just because we were around it so much for mm-hmm. like two years. Yeah. I was definitely a huge fan of pretty much everything in the dance space in like 2017, 2018. Yeah. So it felt really natural to kind of like make that jump. And one of the things that I love about okay. dance is the drama of it. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that like no matter what, that drop is going to punch you in the face. Which is interesting <laughs> because it's kind of similar in ways to licensing music and like trailer music. Cause the cinem- like the cinematic yes. quality lends itself to a similar structure as like a drop. Mm. So it was very because interesting because the very internet smart. is so dynamic. Everything we were doing yes. was yeah. in a weird way building upon itself, even though we never mm. planned for it to do that. It was just like yeah. happenstance. So That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it was just inherent to the way that you were writing and structuring these songs. And because you, uh, DJs know or producer, dance producers know that uh, you need a build up to that drop yeah. and that for the club like that's the big moment mm-hmm. like you said same with trailers they when you're making a trailer trailerizing a song it's looking for those dynamics and the drop and like what are the twists and the turns but it also kind of lent itself and I don't want to like jump too far ahead but when we kind of get to the TikTok era and where you found success yep. uh, namely with, with Dark Side but also Royalty which is like you have the the drop the turn that like that is the moment uh that uh i i don't know if we call it a drop in in the tiktok realm but it is uh that is where the trends kind of a lot of the trends latch onto mm-hmm, is that moment in the song where you have like a glow up trend to exactly. you know dark side or something like that um and so tell me about how we got to that point because you're building upon you're releasing um just constantly with with these DJ collabs yep. and top lines, and you're making Niani music. But you know, 2021. Um, I mean, I'm still seeing. I was scrolling back on your Instagram and stuff, and I'm still seeing you kind of doing acoustic versions of a lot of this stuff. Um, and then there was like a shift where, like, it was either royalty. Or I think royalty took off, or Dark Side took off on TikTok. Mm-hmm. How did that happen? And then, like, tell me about that journey. Yeah. So. Um- 20, so it was 2020, into 2020, we'd done yeah. tons of these DJ claps. We'd gone from like 100,000 multi listeners on Spotify to over a million at that point. And it was like mm, in a span okay. of like eight, nine months. That was so fun. Which was insane for us because we'd <laughs> never seen those kind of numbers ever in our lives. Sure. Um, we'd only yeah. ever dreamed of that. So tw- into 2020, we've been working also with a bunch of independent record labels, like dance labels. Uh, DJs cool. want to put the song out on whatever label they like. So as a top liner, mm-hmm. it's generally like, we're doing cool. one-off Let's songs do all the time. That. Yeah. We'd released um, some songs with a label called Cloud Kid with Bess and Worf and one other collab. Mm-hmm. And so Cloud Kid, they're like an indie label out of Germany. They hit us up end of 2020 and we were like, hey, we'd love to do an EP with you. And we were like, cool. That sounds, this is what yeah. we've always been building to. Want. Like, I love top line. Yeah. I love that. But we wanted to build our own vision for our own product. We also wanted to define so. ourselves in the eyes of the fans that we were already like engaging with that... You know, we wanted to define our sound separate yeah. from the sound of what we were making with the DJs. Mm-hmm. We wanted to make sure totally. that we were our own brand. And that projects felt yes. like the perfect way to Project do Project felt great. We'd been thinking about doing that on our own. And when Cloud Kid reached out, we were like, great, this is awesome. Uh, so that like end of, I think beginning of 2021, we went back in the studio with one of our favorite producers, David Spencer. And we just did mm-hmm. like a week plus of sessions. And that ended up being the record Wars in a Wonderland. But January, we already had like a song called Dark Side that we wanted to put out. Mm-hmm. And so we were like, hey, Cloud Kid, like, do you want this to be maybe a single on the album? And they were like, sure, let's put it out. And so we put that song out. It did normal. Good. Yeah. I would say it was a good release. Uh, we actually ended up sure. releasing, I think technically one week after Dark Side, we had a DJ collab come out, which is mm. wild to think about. Because that. none of us saw Dark Side as the single. We no all loved saw the it as a single. Sure. I loved Dark Side. It was one of my favorite songs. I thought the drop with the... Mm, I loved it. I thought it was great. And I was like, guys, we need to put this out. And so that we put that out. We wrapped up the record. And then we kind of started like planning out the release. And so we rolled Wars in a Wonderland out over like six months. Ended up releasing it Mm -hmm. August 20th of 2021. Love that day. Mm -hmm. We'll always love that day. And it did really good. Like like for us at the time, I think we had like 1.5 million listeners. Um, We had new fan base. It did good. And I was super happy with that at the time. We had Loser was our planned single. 
Um, and then okay. Wonderland was like the, the secondary title single it's title track. It came sure. out on release day. And those two were doing really good. We had some cool campaigns around them. Good. Probably what? I would say 20K a day. Probably. Which was great for us. We were really proud Loved of it. Amazing. It's still yeah. great, by the way. Totally. 20K, getting, getting a song to do it's 20K fantastic. a day is great. So yeah. it's like we we kind of kept releasing after Wars. Um, just some because more that labs. Just, that was what was in our head is that, you know, we've got to keep releasing. putting songs out. Don't want the fans to like move on or, or you know, like, digital, digital age. Yeah. People are kind of, they yeah. move fast. And we were previously in the dance yes. scene that works really, really fast. Really fast. So right. we just kind of kept releasing, right. kind of kept doing our thing. And then February rolls around of 2022. And we saw like a little spike on Dark Side. And I saw that a big TikTok video had gone up. It had like 400,000 views. And it, I'd seen Impact. It was like a music sharing site. Some random picture cool. in the background that said like a song. This makes me feel like yeah. a villain or something. So we saw a little <clears throat> spike. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's cool. So I sent it over to Cloud Kid. And I was like, hey, we should watch this. And then they're like, yo, let's do like a creator campaign. Just see. We'll throw it out there. See what happens. So what's a creator campaign? Creator campaign is like basically when you pay influencers or you put some dollar amount out and influencers can create a videos with the song and get paid whatever it is i mean there's so many different ways to do it you can either like throw a fund out or pay specific people and was cloud kid uh did they fund this creator influencer campaign they funded their portion of it it was like kind of co-funded yeah we wanted to do it because i was like you know what's yeah. going on i want to i want to make it a thing it's obviously got, got some it. legs organically because we saw yeah. organic reach remember? start to happen yeah, do you remember what company you worked with the, for the influencer? We campaign? worked with uh, ATG, ATG, and they had a creator ATG, named okay. Ari Elkins, and he was a music guy, and he like heard the song yeah. and was like, "I want to do a video with it." So we ended up working with him, and he posted his video. He posted the I song. I didn't expect like I, he had great views, great creator. I didn't necessarily expect crazy, crazy. I just expected like, oh, oh it'll be cool. another song in the camp or another video yeah. in the campaign. And it's going to just keep building on itself. But that video did 15 million views in like two days. And it took Wild. the song from like 20,000 streams a day to 250,000 streams a day overnight. overnight. It was wild. wild. I had never seen anything like it. <laughs> we were on <laughs> like viral 50 charts. Like it was wow. wild. crazy. And then we've been indie our whole career outside of like, we'll do an EP One with like deals. an indie record label or whatever. Sure. That week, we had every major label in our email at once. Which and was, we'd never had that been, before. And it was so overwhelming. It was because so It felt so foreign. It was like, because we were self-managed at the time. Still self-managed. Sure. But yeah. we had like eight managers in our inbox. And we had all these major record labels. It was overwhelming. So we like, planned a trip out to LA. So we are like, all right. Everybody. Yeah, I guess we have to go to LA now. So we... And it was still kind of... It was like the pandemic was just like officially kind of ending. So it's still like weird. Mm -hmm. I hadn't traveled in like two years. It was, yeah, and that was a shock yeah. in itself. So shock in itself. So I'm sure. back on an airplane going to LA to meet with major record labels, which, you know, like as right, a, I think right. I was 20 years old at this time. Like <laughs> it was a bit of uh -huh. like a, a Disney moment at yeah. that point. We got to play our yeah. songs in the Capitol building. Like that was cool. And, you know, we yeah. were still indie. Uh, we decided we got all the deals back and we were like, none of this really fits the vision. It and just didn't fit us. And it like, also felt well. like they were really invested in dark side because it was a song mm. that did great and it didn't feel like they right. were as invested in what we saw for yeah Nani. we knew that we wanted to do something and we didn't want someone else to kind of hinder our vision so we decided at that time all right to let's keep doing stick it to our way. guns we'll, we'll stay indie the album had tripled in streams overall so the whole record was seeing this massive benefit because from it was so dark cool side. Dark side had been out a year before it went viral. Yeah, um, it was not right. a so viral hit off right the off bat. The like it no. just it wasn't. Like it was just the song yeah. that I loved and put out and the fans loved, and then had this moment that was lightning in a bottle. Very, very, very hard to replicate. We have tried many times. Yeah, you know, like, has the point. Yeah. The goal is to not try to replicate it exactly. Yeah, just keep making. But we were stuff. like, okay, so obviously there's something here that people like. So let's like stick to what we're doing and just keep doing what we're doing. And that has kind of been what we've done. And we've had other moments like royalty, and that whole story is a very interesting thing in itself because that's one. Did that's one come out in 2021? I think so. Yeah, twenty twenty one. I I saw. It, yeah, I think it came out April twenty one. Yeah, twenty twenty one. Um, before we get on to to royalty, I want to um just step back a second. Uh, 
What were those meetings like, the major label meetings like in L.A.? Tell me about some of them. Uh, they are all, Every first meeting is incredible. Yep. This they is always something we'll talk about. Roll out the red carpet. Every single first meeting, they're telling Everyone's how amazing nice. you are, how much everyone loves you. So, and oh my God, the, whole, the whole team is out, right? You're so pretty. You know you're I mean? so like, smart. Everyone there. Right. And the second meeting is always that's where, where the truth starts you know to come I mean? And it's not that they're mean. It's but just, that's where, like, they yeah. make their intentions more clear. They make their intentions uh-huh. clear. They're done kind of buttering you up at that point. It's, it's like second, third meeting. And then you kind of start mm-hmm. saying, like, oh, this is what it would really be we like. We want to change the brand. We want to change the music. We want to change any number of things. We think you should do this. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, okay. So, like, it's not just, like, we think you're great and magical and special yeah. anymore. Which, I mean, makes sense. And it's not just, like, we love what you're doing and want to, like, you know, help out. Her and um, be involved. Especially... You know, mm-hmm. when Darkside came out, we were still in the eyes of the industry, like a very, very new project. So I'm not like, right. I'm not in any way dissing on that. I totally get it. Sure. But we knew where we wanted to go and we would yeah. hear people talk. And I'd be and like, well, oh, that's be not that. What we want. And then I'd be like, okay, like, I guess maybe, maybe we should not. And that is where it ended up being. And I'm, I'm still glad well, about our decision. I, yeah. No, I mean, I, you know, it's, um, it takes a lot of uh, courage to kind of and and understanding of yourselves to realize that the visions aren't aligning um and especially i mean you know being wooed by the major labels in los angeles at the capitol records yeah. building and all of that like you know rolling out the red carpet and it's just like this is kind of every artist's kind of you know fairy tale like baby dream is like oh i hope you know one day that the powers that be will celebrate exactly. who i am and and give me uh and and you know give me that that uh validity exactly. um, that i'm seeking but so who are your you said you're self managed like who are your advisors at the time or how did you know was it just the two of you be like you know this doesn't feel right or like how did you know to say no <laughs> Yeah so at the time cuz the during the whole dark side experience we were self managed um Yeah and it was just a lot of like trust our gut we're really close with our parents so I would talk to our Good mom our dad about it they were like they would always be in the room like we would have to take zoom calls and I always take them in my room. This is my room. So I would, and they would sit there like next to it and they'd be like, all right, we're going to point out like red flags. What are the problems? What are the problems? And then we're really close to David Spencer as well. And David's a great producer, but he's also a dude in his 40s with a family who's been very grounded. And so he's not one of those dudes that can get kind of caught up anymore. He's like, okay, but what is actually what you want? Is this what you want? Like, let's talk about it. So we had just had like very good, I would love it. I mean, like adult, because I was twenty at the time, which is totally as an adult. Mm-hmm. But but mm-hmm. I was same still time, young, like, and like very your dreams are coming true, right? So it's very easy, yeah. and I think a lot of young artists, especially during the same time period, fell mm-hmm. into the same thing where they're like so excited that they put their name on something, right. and it's not right. Mm-hmm. But it's because it was so right. exciting. So I was right there. Oh yeah. But then it's about taking a step back talking to people that you like trust and saying this is mm-hmm. it, and then getting contracts back. Reading like, like, yeah. we read, I worked really hard to get 18%. Yeah. Like we would get, yeah. we had 18, one of the deals was 18%. And I was like an 18% yeah. deal. Like you I don't have to get so many we, streams. Yeah. We've released a lot on DistroKid. Like I get to look and I would only get 18% of that. Like that's not. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and then you got to pay the producer out of that too. Pay the producer, like, oh. got to pay your manager. Right. Eventually we did. And during that time, per- time period, work with a manager. And we've since worked with like a couple teams. We're back to being self-managed. Sure. But, um, yeah, during like the, the the saying yes, the decision making period of Dark Side, we were self managed, and it was just a lot of like trust your gut. If it doesn't feel one hundred percent right right now, it's only going to get worse from there. Yeah, because mm-hmm. people are on their best behavior at the beginning of those before, early meetings. Before you sign that contract, they're on their best behavior. Once your name, <laughs> once the words. ink is dried. So if you're seeing red flags or something's not feeling right before. Definitely, definitely don't sign your name because the problems aren't going to get smaller. They're going to get bigger. So mm. we learned that and we just decided, all right, it was a hard choice. But yeah, because in some ways, like that was the dream. Like eight-year-old Caitlin yeah. was like, I'm going to get signed by Atlantic Records. Like, yeah. That's what I want. And then you're on a phone call with Atlantic Records and it just, you know, it, it has a feeling to it. And yeah. then like yeah. Caitlin and I, something interesting kind of about us is like our family isn't, doesn't have background in music. 
all of my friends, like my best friend is an electrician and my cousin's a plumber. So then when we told everybody that we were going to be artists professionally. There was a lot of raised eyebrows. I was like, what are you doing? That's not a real job. Like my grandfather, he's a retired firefighter. And he was like, you're going to be a what? what? I'm be like, I'm going to be a musician. And he was like, and his your first reaction artist. was, well, then I think you should have a banjo. And he just showed up at the house yeah. with a banjo. With a banjo. <laughs> and I, was like, I know how to play the banjo. I love that. So, I mean, it's, it's great. But yeah, so then a part of that would, was like, they don't understand, like my friends don't necessarily understand what I'm doing. But if I could tell them I'm signed to a record label, then they would understand. Right. They'll get right. it, right? And so that is a right. part of it. But it just kind of took taking the glamour out of it and realizing I'm going to have to live like this for whatever that contract duration, whether it's two years or five years or whatever. And it just ended mm-hmm. up being, this isn't right. Let's stick to what we're doing. Obviously, something is working. Yeah. So let's just yes. lean in. And that took us, I think, to like 2 million, 2.5 million monthly listeners at that time. So I was like, we just had massive growth. Like, let's just like keep releasing. And so during that time period, yeah. we worked with some managers, released like another EP called All My Favorite Monsters. Mm-hmm. Had a bunch of fun doing it. and. Mm-hmm. Then decided, all right, listener growth is one thing, but fan base growth is a totally different, is a totally yes. different thing. So we got to figure out how to turn listeners into fans. And that mm. is honestly like still something that we're, we're doing. I think it's something yeah. that every artist is always doing. So during that time, we didn't have necessarily another viral hit off the bat, except for the whole royalty thing, which was just a whole, just a whole thing. So crazy. But we didn't have something viral. But it was okay because our fan base was every day you growing. pick up, you know, another what, another thousand or two thousand listeners. And that was us heading in the right it. direction. And that's just and I think that that is where people get like really nervous is they're like, I don't have virality right now. And I'm like, Yeah, you're not gonna have virality every, every day. day. It's just about being yeah. consistent and showing up for your fan base every day. That they are yeah. who matters. When also yeah. if you keep on your grind and you keep putting the music out, by the next time you go viral, there's so much for people yeah. to like consume and enjoy and be invested in. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, go ahead. Keep going. No, keep you going. Go, ahead. go for it. You go ahead. I've talked to you. No, I was going to ask you. So like, how, how did you and are you converting listeners into fans? Yeah. So <clears throat> t- let me have timeline wise. So 20 into 2022, we were just releasing music and then kind of beginning of 2023, we had never done short form content. So during the entire Dark Side release, we did, I think, mm. one video. It was all influencer driven. It was all a lot of it was violence. all just wow. UGC driven. So it ended up being, I think, a song mm-hmm. that like now has like uh like what like over a million UGCs, which is crazy because it was just entirely people hearing the song and then wanting to make right. their own story to the and song. And it was really fun to see like sure. what kind of like creators and what kind of like people gravitated towards it. Um as much as like there was a ton of like cool makeup transitions, it was specifically like cosplay, acting, or, like people acting. would like build their own stories. And so it was just this very cool thing. But cool. my point in that being, we didn't do any short form. And so I've mm. noticed the change in the industry where it's, you know, it's, it's all short form driven. So beginning of 2023, we were like, all right, it's time that we quit. You know, there's no more resistance. Avoiding the TikTok train. It's time right, to, make to short figure form out content. how to do it. And I always hated video and picture. I didn't like it. I just liked making songs. And so I didn't like that part mm. of it. So I had to confront that because that's the industry right now. So we started yeah. making content roughly beginning of 2023. We started really going in on it. Uh, when I looked at Caitlin in May of 2023, we made a song called Funeral and I'd posted a video and it did like 400,000 views, which I was Lord because we were getting like no views because you know how TikTok can be. And I saw sure. pre-saves jump and I was like, this is a thing. This is a thing. This, and so I this looked, is a game changer. I looked at her and I was like, all right, it's time to do five days a week content every single week. And of she course, was like, five days. It was a big fight. I was like, I okay, know I it wasn't you. a fight. It I was, think, it was a little bit of a fight. At the time, you know, you don't know what you're doing. So like I have all these cameras. Sure. It's just overwhelming. And I think that a lot of artists yeah. are there too. And I, I'm right there with you yeah. still to this day. Uh, I've been doing this for like yeah. a while. So yeah, five days a week after that. And that led us to having Funeral, which, you know, had some viral videos on it, did really well. And that took us to Villain, which had some viral videos. And a song mm-hmm. called Knives had some viral videos. And the latest uh, Body Bag had viral videos. And it's insane because the pre-saves and like the, it just it's made it, the release exciting for the fans because yeah. there was a lot of anticipation. There was a lot of even on the people being involved, even on like the non-viral videos. Like I, we noticed when we were putting out more content like that, 
the fan base was more excited. And they also, were more when like, they were able to see our faces instead, because we, from an mm-hmm. album art perspective, we love graphic art. Yeah, with um, art. And we were like, the, sh- the shift in the fans from being able to see our faces was huge. Like, it was, there was just so much more mm-hmm. It was kind of what connection. we were talking about earlier between listener base and fan base. I mm-hmm. feel like sometimes if you're not connected, like, visually at all to your project, you can kind of end up creating a listener base, which is great, by the way. Right. Like, if you have a listener base, that's you a You can win. make a whole life off of that. But we started in live and we want to get back to live. So, we were like, all right, yeah. we got to build a fan base. And so, that was kind of like our whole journey with that. And that's, you know, this still the one that we're on. We've had some amazing moments. We've had some absolutely terrible moments where we've had no views for weeks on end. And um, happens. that happens. Yeah. That's just the algorithm. We literally started um, every, like once a week. We're like, okay, no tears over TikTok. Especially no the over first TikTok. few months. We're like, no tears over TikTok. <laughs> tears over TikTok. Video, like, no tears over TikTok. Video, you spend, I'm going to make a t-shirt yes, that says that. right? Because it's like the video you spent eight hours editing. I cut you in 18% of those royalties. Don't worry. I appreciate it. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the video you spent eight hours editing gets like 12 views. And the video you just randomly right. record on your phone because you were out and about. I think the lighting's not that great. And like, one million like there's videos out there where right. I like I hate how my hair looks but I have nothing to post so I have to post this one million two million five million views the one I spent eight right. hours on my magnum opus of my video none that. and it's just like Isn't that's that how, how that it goes. is and I think it's been a real experience like learning a completely different side of art which is yeah. video yeah. and I've fallen in love with it since i love making videos i love editing videos final cut is my best friend i'm literally in it like every day all day but i used to hate it and dread it yeah and we're watching like yeah. like heaven work was also oh, super inspiring. So inspiring because he loves it like he eats sleeps and, and specifically video. he loves short form context a lot of times when you work with videographers yeah. they're like yeah we'll make some short form like, yeah. um, or we'll repurpose the long form you know what I mean? It's just but it like, never really works. Was Evan just has a short attention span. Let me tell you, uh, Evan, I, like I had him over. We I had a poker night and I had Evan over. And we were like, you know, trading the the proverbial ox cable. And we're, yeah. we're playing, we're showing each other all of these songs. And uh, it gets to Evan to show us a song. He plays 20 seconds yep. of a song and then he goes to the next one. I'm like, dude, yep. dude, you can't, this isn't TikTok. Like we're here to listen to, to real songs, to full music, but he, his, his attention span I'm is so short. You. But you know, he's built a whole career yeah, off that. So good for Evan, him. Evan, I, I watched your podcast last night, which is an amazing podcast, by the way. Um, and I watched him <laughs> say that like videographers are kind of like new a And I wanted to point out that yeah. body bag is our kind of our latest, it's had virality, whatever. Yes. I played him body bag. Our Months team ago. at the side at the time didn't want to release it. They were like, we don't think it's one. And I played mm. it for him because I really loved the funky bass line. And I thought it was a quirky, weird, funny song. And as soon as that he, was like the whole yeah. thing, it's like this funny little song where it's kind of like almost a tongue-in-cheek joke the entire time. Right, right. I got it. It was like my sense of humor. And so I as soon as he heard that, ha ha, did you miss me? He was like, This he is was like the, this is the you one. gotta put this out. And I was like, you know Which is the second verse, which isn't verse. even the hook, it isn't even the chorus. Nope. And that's like his knack because he's been doing this so yeah. long, especially with like Flying a Boss, which he, you know, he stepped us through the whole journey of like how they found that moment. Mm-hmm. And it's not always the chorus, it's not, not always what comes naturally to musicians, where we always think the chorus is the selling mm-hmm. point. That's what's gonna bring people in. That's our hookiest part, whatever. But when it comes to TikTok, it's a completely different kind of storytelling. Crazy. And that, because yeah, he's latched onto that. Dark Side was the chorus into the like the post chorus or the sure. drop or whatever you want to call it. But Funeral, yeah. which was kind of like our our other viral thing, like after Dark Side, that was the second verse. verse. It was it's the really lyrical yeah. journey. Like, it was like a story, and people attached it in a different way that I didn't even write it. But like the comment section was filled sure. with their stories and their emotions. And I think as artists, it's kind of like we have to remember we are it's our art and we want to tell our stories, but at the end of the day, we're telling other people's stories because they're going to interpret it their own way. So it's like, in a way, right. social media can go a few different ways. Something like dark side is like this cool little thing where people can create like a little like transition or whatever. It's like very social media or like you can release a song that has yeah. like a very emotional moment that people can tie into their lives. Or it's something like Body Bag where it's just like, did she literally just say, ha ha, did you miss me, bitch? Like it's completely yeah. what shocking. stops the scroll is what you're looking for. You have to catch them in the first two seconds. And whatever that is, so, is, yeah. is magic. I So, I, I you know, it's, it, this, it all makes complete sense. And I think anyone who's, you know, spent enough time on TikTok kind of gets that philosophy is like, of course, you know, stop the scroll, yeah. catch them in the first two seconds. But as artists, as musicians, as someone like you said, said that you uh, hated video, yep. You, you know, do it for the music, did it for the music, didn't understand this. 
what made you come around to not just accept this as like a, a necessary evil or something like that that you had to do for the art to get the art out there, but actually lean into it. And it sounds like, you know, you're inspired by right. it and now you're editing the videos and, and, you know, get excited by it. So tell me about that emotional evolution. I think that we have two very different perspectives on this. So I think we should probably both okay. answer this separately, but I'm a very- Please disciplined person like it's it's kind of i'm stubborn to a fault it's not a good thing like it's very destructive it mm -hmm. helps like i decided on my 18th birthday i'm gonna make my bed every single day for the rest of my life and i've never missed it because i'm just that type of really person. well in the military like i just i'm that type of person <laughs> and it's very destructive sure. and highly annoying like well, not, especially as somebody yeah. who would not consider myself to have that level of discipline but i'm it's, more like it's okay. honestly live in the moment i'm sure. a killjoy i am no that fun. is not true. but when i told you type a exactly very you need, she, we need the system yeah, she is like systems. the freest spirit ever and so like the two of us it's holy it's literally hilarious but so when i told myself i'm doing this five days a week it was a promise yeah. to myself that no matter how hard it got or no matter how much i didn't want to do it that day i was going to put something out and it's always mm. noon central time. We post at we are noon central time, 1 p.m. Eastern time every single day. Even when we're flying, like when we're traveling. I'll pay post, for the extra. We'll pay for the whatever the Wi-Fi is. We have to post an hour early. We have to post an hour Great. early. But it was that promise to myself that I'm going to learn this and I'm going to figure out a way to love it. And I fun. kind of just willed it into existence. The first, like, I would say at least five months, I despised it because I don't know what I'm mm. doing in the platform. I work, we work in logic. Final Cut has different shortcuts. It's an entirely new system. way of thinking. And so it was just annoying. Like I'd right. done video editing before, but never like anything serious. And so I really, really, really disliked it. And then I edited, it was kind of like a weird, I had to edit a music video because our the guy who was supposed to be editing it didn't catch the memo that he was supposed to be editing it. It was this whole thing. <laughs> and so then we had a week yeah. and no one to edit the video. And it was like the collaborator and so I was like, cool, I'll Thank edit God it. for Sydney. She was like, I'll just do it. I was like, I'll just do it. I'll figure it out. It was a visualizer. How, you know, I can figure it out. I've been editing video for a few months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it really forced me to like. It's the best way to exactly learn. Exactly. It forced me to find yeah. the artist. Forced into it. She jumped yep. right into the deep end. I yep. jumped right into the deep end. Great. I mean, there's still like, there's so many things about that video that went wrong. Like I tried, it was all 60p. And then I tried to bounce it in 24. And then all the effects were bad. So the frame rates were Just all like confused. So much oh, learning. Gosh. Like I made so sure. many errors. Like everything was yeah. wrong. And I had a week to figure it out. And when I finished it, I was very tired and grouchy. So grouchy. But I was also like, I felt my so main job that week was just to show up with like snacks and food that yeah, she it took me like oh, it was a visualizer that took me sister. like four days which is insane for a visualizer but i didn't know what i was doing so like that kind of yeah. happened and i learned a lot in that process because i was editing three minutes instead of 15 seconds and so then i was like okay yeah. like there's lots of cool different things you can do and like it can be an art which i know is very obvious but but like not for me i was thing. not doing artistic video editing i mean i'm still sure. you know i'm still green i'm very green but and then working with evan watching his passion for it and we would just talk cameras and we would talk editing and Evan loves to like show you how to do something too like and that's one of like the many things we love yeah. about him so he'll be like oh hey I cool. saw that video you posted last week and I think if you tried to do it like this it yeah. would be better we're like okay cool it was just inspiring watching him work and talking to him and so I just really I think I don't think it was like a sudden thing I think I just slowly started disliking it less until that disliking it less turned to I'm okay with it and then I'm okay with it kind of slowly turned into, oh my God, I literally just edited a video yesterday and I did like this after effects spinning thing. But you know how you usually get the, the black bars when you spin videos? I did this cool effect to like make the, and I was so excited. You I ran so, downstairs to so hyped. I was like, you have to see this. <laughs> I'm so excited. And it's like, it's not yeah. an overnight thing. I didn't love it the day I started, but now I get excited about it. And that's not to like say that I don't have days where I'm like, I want to <laughs> not edit my videos. Computer out the window like that's just yeah, what's gonna yeah. happen but yeah that's kind of how i learned i don't know i don't know how you feel well, it was actually something that you said um that kind of inspired me you were like i feel like these songs deserve more attention they deserve to get the pre-saves and we're letting yeah. the songs down if we don't do this yeah. and i was like okay that makes sense because i adore these songs these songs are a, a part of me and they're a part of you and they do deserve to get this attention so i'm just gonna you know dive in and do it even if I don't want to. I would say I have more days where I want to throw my 
computer out the window than you do right you're now. Just, okay, I started editing like three months before so you. So I'm just three months. So you're just three months. You're three months away. You're editing too, Kaylin, yes. videos? Yeah, pretty much. She okay. edits like you're most most of the time I edit anything I'm in and most of the time she edits anything she's in. And if we're in it together, I still I would it. say I probably edit, edit it. You don't want me to edit those. And then I'm, you wanna pick I'm type A. So like, I'm like, I want to have yeah. control. And then Evan, obviously, right, right, right. he edits. Edits um, his so, videos. Some yeah. of the best Diani videos out there. But <clears throat> yeah, so I, I appreciate that. Because I do I do totally believe that about the songs. Is like That's what kind of got me in. Is I was like, these songs deserve, deserve better. They're like her children. And it's not that they're right. not great. They just aren't getting, the algorithm isn't loving on them the way it needs to yet. Because we haven't built that. And marketing changed. Yeah. I mean, you used to be able to market stuff in traditional ways. Or you used to be able to use right. like, I mean, YouTube channels for marketing. They're still big. But they were huge like three years ago. And then that kind of right. shifted. YouTube shorts started kicking up. So, right. yeah. I mean, I, I still see that you're releasing videos on YouTube, horizontal okay. videos, the visualizers, lyric videos, music videos. Um, I guess, why are you, what's the what's the intention behind doing uh, long form videos on YouTube versus short form on TikTok, Instagram, or even YouTube shorts? Yeah, so I think short form, obviously, as Evan said in his as well, is king. There's no question about I that. Think it's the number one way to mm -hmm. get somebody into your catalog. Mm -hmm. But I okay. think the the horizontal long form is a great way to make them invested. I'm not gonna lie. The reason we started doing long form mm -hmm. videos is because uh, we got Spotify back, wrapped back one year, and our canvases had like 30 million views. And at that point, we weren't in them. We were using graphics. We were using graphics, or we were using like stock footage videos. We had stock footage lyric videos for a really long time because they were very cheap to create. And so new yeah. artists use Fiverr. Like, please go use Fiverr and get Fiverr some, is like, get some great, you can get some really cool videos for like very inexpensive. And that's sure. a lot of really yeah. talented creators just like kind of looking for their own stuff. Yep. Oh. So we did that yep. for years and all like to this day, Dark Side's Canvas is stock footage. Which we're I've working been trying on to change we're for so long, but you don't like the video I made. Um, so we kind of sat down after Spotify Rap one year and we were like, all right, that needs to change. We have to be in our canvases. Because so from like a brand recognition standpoint, and from a brand building outside of just the music, that was a huge miss. Mm -hmm. We were missing that. Like, because if somebody knows your face, they're going to be way more willing to stop on social media, buy a t shirt. But yeah. they didn't know yeah. our faces because we weren't in the canvases that everybody was all over that our fan base was streaming on Spotify and that they were looking mm. at. So we started the YouTube videos predominantly because we wanted cool canvases. Oh, okay. And that was like, I know you can shoot a. 15 whatever second canvas but i was like right. i want it like to be like cool whatever so we want to make it a thing for the fans make it a thing and, and we wanted like new right. content we didn't want to do like the the stock footage there videos anymore we just wanted to try something different and so we worked with a videographer yeah. for i would say about six or seven months six or seven months eight months great great dude great videos and but they're very expensive so yes. i think as anybody yeah. knows yeah. even like we we definitely like booked our own locations. They didn't have air conditioning. We definitely like pared it down. And we were down, really even expensive. when we were working with the videographer, it was uh, a two was, person team. Yeah. Um. So we, we scaled it all the way back. It was like no luxury. Like it was like one dude, like I'd bring my fog machine. Like it was like no luxury yeah. even yeah. then. Like we would build this section. We did this sure. video in like a clear box. And my dad built yeah. the box out of plexiglass, like by hand. Hell and he yeah. went out into Go the down. middle of nowhere to buy it used off this dude who like sold it to him for like 15 bucks. So like <laughs> we were still paring it down, but it was still really expensive. And it that's like, as much as it, it's possible, it's not necessarily like easy to justify because as as everybody knows, yeah. it's short form, it's king. So, yeah. but I still liked the music videos. The fans liked the music yeah. videos. We do premieres where everyone's excited. We put like little Easter eggs for cool. the next song in it. So there was like a, a fan base. They really felt fed when we gave them that. And it was, it was something a, that was possible, like it, from where we were in our lives and in our career, yeah. it was something that was possible. So we were like, okay, yeah. let's let's do this for them and let's give it to them. And then also, nice. I have so much fun. I come up with all the music video concepts and the locations and whatever. Like we build props by hand. Like oh, yeah. I love oh, that yeah. type of stuff. So I was like, I don't want to give it up. Cool. So like, let's let's keep doing them. And then I transitioned over to editing them, which is free. And I think yeah. time consuming. I think the first villain, one, the first one, villain. No, we we actually we shot villain ourselves, and then we paid an editor. And sometimes, like, we'll like so like if I'm like, have a crazy week or something, I'll still like pay an editor sometimes. But villain, we paid an editor. Yeah. We, I think the first official one we was did body was body bag, and yeah. so we've done body bag, sucker punch, groundhog day, and then Evan did utopia. So I've done like the last 
three. And it's just cool. been, it's been fun. Like for Groundhog Day, I wanted like a picture frame, a picture frame because the whole song's very sad. It's about grief. And I wanted this picture frame, frame that I could throw paint all over, like in the box and describe and no matter matter how messy grief is. No matter how hard I looked on Pure Space and Ave, there was nothing like that. No one is going to let you, by the way, like a psych wall. No one's going to let paint. you throw paint on that. So I had said, yeah. I'm going to build it. And my dad was like, I'm you are very not anxious. qualified to build a eight foot box and i was like okay right and so then i went she did it anyway i did it anyway and then i did it wrong and i had to undo it all like i went to i tell you i went to lowe's about 500 times people started to look a little concerned they i but. know their names by the way <laughs> like i ha i have i know their names like they knew me and i did it wrong and then i had to undo it all and then my dad had to help me which you know which was, i helped you did. You did. But it took me like three days. But now, <laughs> now I know like basic carpentry. I can't even build an Ikea cube. So I give you major props. I, it was I wild. literally built a, my Ikea cubes wrong and had to pull them apart, which once you build an Ikea it's cube, a, you, you can't unbuild that shit. Think, it locks in and yeah, it's done. Yeah. And uh, I fucked those things up so many I, times. So major props for doing think, it the real way. Because I think that no Ikea is harder than real building anyway. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Thank the, you. The pictures that's, don't maybe make, that's just they don't I'll be, I'll be I'll be 100 real that with you though. Sense. I did completely do it wrong the first time because um, okay. it's it's hard, and I learned a yeah. lot about bolts and different types of screws. And also, you shouldn't use pressure treated wood for something that shouldn't be outside. The entire thing is built out of pressure treated wood, so which so is about heavy. five times heavier than normal lumber. So the box weighs like mm, who even knows? 800 pounds. It's still <laughs> more than five. literally oh still my in my garage. You can't take it apart. I don't know how. Oh god! So just gonna... Well, you got a great video out exactly. of it, so you know all ends that uh, all well that ends well. So I find it like, um, videos and long form videos. I think that the reason we still do them is because it's a creative outlet. It's something the fans really connect with. Yeah. I think it's more of like a fan incubator thing. You're not going to get new fans necessarily off of it, but when they get in, yes. having something, yes. having a world for them to dive into, mm -hmm. I think is really important. Yes. No, that's, I mean, really well put, and and um, absolutely, the long form videos are for the fans to to help. <laughs> them dive deeper, help them get to know you a little bit better, uh, you know, understand your story a little bit more. So speaking of kind of fans, um, you know, and, and mentioning getting back to live, do you have plans to perform again? I mean, I, I, I don't even think you have a bands in town, to be honest, I, mean, I couldn't find it. Like, when are you going to be playing live? That is a very good question and something we've been talking about a lot, especially over the last six months. We don't have currently like any dates set, but that is definitely yeah. like the next phase, I would say. Yes, it's very much in the brain okay. soup. Uh, we're getting emails all the time. Like um, every day we'll get like three or four emails. Which is like, like when are you going thing on tour? Ever. When are you going on tour? Because for so long yeah. we played empty rooms, yeah. restaurants. So like to have people be like, right. I want to see I you live. I think it's also like for us, it's like partially terrifying because we did play all those empty rooms. So it's like, there's like I really part don't of my wanna... soul that's like, what if I book this and nobody, and nobody shows up? That never goes like, away, by I the way. No. Like, Chris Martin of Coldplay says that that's still I'm his like, biggest I, fear before every show. Like He's playing stadiums. Like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I know. What if just nobody yeah. shows up just except like, for like uh, three people who you. hate me and ask me to play Margaritaville? You'll put on a great show for those three people. The, you know, the entire yeah, thing hey. will have to be Margaritaville or uh, what is the other song? Right. Freebird. <laughs> free play Freebird. Like I think that there's still right. some trauma. So do you know how you would do a show? Uh, because I know that like now with this full production, this dance thing, I mean, are you, obviously you're not going to be doing the same clubs you did when you were teenagers playing acoustically. Like this is now yeah. such a dance show. I mean, are you going to tour with a DJ? Are you going to be doing more of those kind of nightclubs? I mean, have you really kind of thought about that? Or you said you've been through different managers. Have you talked to booking agents? Have you kind of like, how far down that pathway have you gone? We have talked to some booking agents. We still are trying to find like the okay. one that we feel like fits our vision. Our vision, Because we do have like a very specific way cool. that we kind of want to do this. As far as a stage setup, we've always talked about since the beginning of Neani. It would be the live show would be like the two of us and then like a drummer who like also runs drums. Runs pretty much everything behind the scenes. Because Sick. basically how like okay. Neani music cool. is, it wouldn't be Neani if it didn't have the big sense and stuff. And so although our old live days, right. I mean, we didn't have a click track running in our ears of the five-piece band. Like that was like how we used to do things. None of us had ears. Okay. Like it was all live monitors. And so when sure. we started Neani, we're like, all right, we're not going to do any we're going to make this we're going to make this right we would want it to be tracks and like the big right. you know, we wanted to have that you know cinematic energy that we brought with us from dance and from the licensing space so yeah we've always talked about the two of us and then a drummer who runs tracks that's like very energetic also we love 21 pilots and so their shows were like 
peak inspiration for Caitlin yeah. and I. Um, and I definitely want to add lasers. I realize that that might be farther down the yeah, road. it's a little farther down the road. But, you know, eventually <laughs> there will be lasers. And we've always talked about doing, like, I love kind of like the new setup of kind of more limited run headline tours for, like, emerging acts, which I would I would consider us. Yeah, especially in the live space. space. Especially, I mean, we're, we're yeah. dead in the water in the live space. We haven't done any Niani shows. So I would say we're not emerging there yet. Um, but yeah. I would say limited number and, like, our Spotify top cities, which is some places in Europe, yeah. some places in the US. I would love to get to India. Those are expensive. Probably going to be tickets. maybe a little bit longer than Europe and US just because it's a little harder to get there. But I saw that India was a few of your top cities. Why do you think that? I mean, I saw Indonesia, mm-hmm. India. Like, why do you think the music's resonating over there so much? I mean, I don't know necessarily why the music is resonating over there specifically. I do know that India, like Jakarta, Indonesia, and a lot of cities in India, they have so much population that they're trigger cities. So yeah. if something, okay, having Los Angeles be your number one city is a lot harder than, than having because the their population so bigger. density too. There's like there's like billions of people. There's billions of people in India. Like it's a massive country, and it's got so much yeah. depth of like love for music that when your music kind of starts connecting over there, word of mouth, there's so many people yeah. to love it. And I mean, I see this totally. a lot with like, especially like anyone who's had necessarily like a viral moment. Jakarta and Indian cities are just big trigger cities uh, for the rest mm. of the world to kind of get on board. Because still overall, our biggest listener number is in the U.S. Yeah. But in the U.S., we're so spread out. And like if yeah. U.S. cities just aren't like Chicago is great. It's a big city. It's got nothing We live in on Jakarta, the, the suburbs like, of Nashville. And wow. That's considered separate from Nashville. So just living. I live 30 minutes outside mm-hmm. of Nashville, but I'm in a different city. I'm in a different city. So then it's like yeah. American cities are weird. I they're great, but from like a from yeah. a data perspective, they're a little bit different Harder than, to track. than like a Indonesia or an in India. Where I mean yeah. the shows over there too. If you've are ever so seen cool. like their festivals are sick, they're music loving countries. Same with Brazil. Like Brazil yeah. is a massive. Yeah, I saw Sao Paulo was one of your fir- biggest ones. Yeah, too. and they're just mm-hmm. music. Like music is so big in their and they're culture also and so very big. excited about like the new music. Yeah. I feel like in the U.S. we get advertised so like advertised to so often. We're a little bit desensitized to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in a lot yeah. of ways in Brazil and in India, they're very open minded to a new project. Totally. Um, and that can kind of like be your foothold to really start to be like, okay, this is what I'm doing, and this is what people like me for. Yeah. I mean, look at like Taylor Swift. I think one of her biggest shows was in Brazil, right? Yeah. I mean, wrong on that. Mm-hmm. It was like one of our big... Mm-hmm. It's just such a music-loving, like, group of people. And they're awesome. And they're all really yeah. nice. So, I love... Brazilian <laughs> fans, Indian fans, and That's Asian great. fans. That's great. Out. The internet is not always very yeah. nice. So, the fact that you've had nice, nice Especially people Especially American internet. internet. American we, internet is... We, we, like to, we like to talk shit. It's just part of, I guess, our... It's our part of our culture. culture. <laughs> but... Brazilian, Indonesian, Indian fans. Y'all are so nice. <laughs> the nicest. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, Caitlin said, this has been such a pleasure talking with you and the time has just flown by Crazy. and uh, I appreciate you like, you know, going so deep with all of this and, um, and it's, it's inspiring your work ethic, uh, the systems and all of that you've put together to, to make it happen. Because I mean, just the, the amount of volume that you have put out in terms of content, songs, videos, short form, long form, I mean, it's astounding. I mean, it, not many artists um, have that tenacity or, um, you know, can can do that. I mean, it's just, it takes a lot of energy and effort. And so it is uh, very impressive um, and you're clearly very prolific. And so I, I know you're not slowing down anytime soon. Uh, so you can get back to the music and back to the content <laughs> creation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go with, but I have one final question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. And that is, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? I think if you can pay for your apartment and your cat and your grocery bill, you have made it in the music industry. Everything else is just icing. But yeah. if you're living and like existing, doing your passion as your job and you can pay to be alive, you did it. I mean, you get to wake up every morning and do the one thing that you would do if no one would pay you. Like if I would continue making art if nobody paid me and nobody listened because it's like, it's a part of who I am and I feel like that's something we share. So if you get to make money doing what you love and have a life off that, I mean, what else more could you ask for? What else more could you ask for? Amen. Niani, Caitlin, Sydney, thank you so much. That thank was great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Awesome. 
Today's episode was edited by Ari Davids with music by Brassroots District and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.